Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Business Line Podcast. My name is Brian. This is my good friend, Manny, over there. He doesn't have much to say today. So we got a fantastic, fantastic show ready for you guys today. Our guest, Andreas Klarik, he is the co-founder of a company called Fuse. He is a, he's got his MBA from Harvard Business School, and he's a UPenn alum for his undergraduate degree. He actually started, I found out, at Notre Dame, and he transferred over to UPenn. So, but anyway, Fuse is a company, it's a next gen loan origination software company where they build custom workflows and integrations without compromising scalability and security. Um, this allows them to simplify lending for financial institutions through self serve customizations. Um, he met his co founder at the Harvard Business School, and together they faced all kinds of unique challenges, including a successful pivot and, and even opted to not take a YC offer after it was extended to him. That's a big deal to turn something like that down. But over the last decade, Andreas has been uh, involved in a lot of different opportunities even before he started his his business with his co-founder. He worked on Wall Street. Um, he was investing in tech and business services, which gave him a, a really cool awareness of the issues slowing down lenders uh, from achieving their highest potential. He's an immigrant. So he was born in the US, but his family's from Bolivia. They moved back to Bolivia. And we're gonna find out a little bit more about his life growing up in Bolivia, what, what what that was like, the unique challenges of coming to the States and becoming success, successful in the way he is today. I'm really excited to get this going, Manny. Are you ready to bring in Andreas? Yeah? All right, bud. I'm excited too. Okay, Andreas, welcome to the Business Line Podcast. Hey, Andreas. How's it going, bud? Hey, Ma Manny. How are you? Hi, Brian. Good morning. Yeah. Hi. So good morning. Good morning. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. We're excited to to, to meet you and learn a little bit more about kind of your life and your journey to where you are today and obviously about uh, the moving and shaking you're doing with your business and stuff. So, Awesome. Looking forward. Uh, happy Tuesday. Yeah. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the business line. Um, Manny, let's, uh, how about you start this off? We were talking yesterday about trying to really get a grasp on what Fuse is. So being the, being the founder at, at, or one of the co-founders at Fuse, Give us a little background on on the company and what yeah. what's going about on your right story. Now. You know, what's your story? How it started? You know, yeah, the story of the company. I think it, we cannot really uh, miss how we kind of came about and we met as uh, as co-founders. I, I met my co-founder uh, at grad school. We both we both met at Harvard eight years ago, and uh, I kind of went in to continue my career in finance, and uh, my co-founder went and. Uh, started an, uh, an unrelated business. I stayed in touch with him. And during the pandemic, as I was kind of like, like everyone else uh, asking your, yourself a lot of questions and introspective with a lot of introspection and, and time in our hands at home, I, I thought, hey, I want to start a company. So I started consulting with pro folks or checking, getting advice from folks that had already started businesses. And I checked in with him. I, I, we bounced uh, some ideas of things that I wanted to do. And uh, he, uh, I, I he was basically in between ideas and and, and he liked the idea that I, at least this, on the surface what what, what i was uh, what, what i was thinking about uh we decided to join forces he came he uh, and we launched a business that originally was a direct to consumer brand it was a direct to consumer brand in the fin in the finance space but uh it it, it, it it that business kind of gave us an entry point an access point to where we are today in essence, uh, we had started working with a bunch of lenders uh, to, to, to which we were actually selling auto loans. And uh, they started asking us, hey, guys, like it's cute that you're selling us auto loans, but what we really want to understand is what type of technology you're utilizing to like essentially bundle these loans and like prepare all the documentation because we've never seen anyone um, uh, be funded as fast as you guys or like the, the, the information being clean and all of that. So... Uh, that that gave us an insight that what our customers really were interested in was not necessarily in our in our acquisition funnel of loans, but they were interested in the technology we had developed. So uh, little by little, we we instead of like uh, instead of selling them loans, it does we would be more far more interested in if you sell us a software. So we productized mm. that that software and turned it into Fuse, and uh, we raised over ten million bucks of capital. Um, and, and in essence. We, we, to, to build that technology that allows uh, lenders to be much more nimble, much more like tech forward, and in essence, like be digitally native, so to speak. So in trying to do one thing, you created something that became really what the company is now. 
Exactly. We, I mean, frankly speaking, I did not know about the loan origination system space up until we built the original company. Like then uh, in the process of, of actually building that company, we decided that like uh, the existing uh, technology that other companies had was not necessarily up to what we wanted to do. Uh-huh. And we built something internal. That internal tool ended up being um, what, what, what fuses today. Kind of, uh, if you use Slack at work, Slack was the same thing, right? It was an internal tool that turned into a massive business. So right. uh, that you have a bunch of stories that like things that like start as a, uh, like just an internal thing that is actually the, the most powerful tool and then the actual business and value of the enterprise. Okay. So help us understand a little bit um, for, for us laymen, that yeah. loan origination space that you didn't quite understand until you started yeah. getting into this part of stuff. So in essence, when you apply for a loan, there's a series of orchestration layers uh, and, and processes that need to happen in order for you to be told yes or no. And I, if you're going to get a letter that say no, because there's like a legal component to it, that you, or if you're going to be told yes, there's an entire set of steps that that bank credit union you know, finance company needs to follow in order for you to like get the funds, get told yes, sign documentation and all of that. So that's what a loan origination system does. It, it's a think about it as a hub, as an airport, right? Like a lot of planes land. Some planes they need to be refueled. Some planes need to be cleaned up, and all of that. It, and and most of the the system up until we we were, we were created, it was kind of like if you've been in New York recently, uh, it's kind of it, they used to look like what like what they used to look like ten years ago. And now what we're offering is a much better technology that allows folks to really like. Uh, process things much faster, utilize technology they want, and not be really subject to what uh, what their software tells them that they can do. Right? Like we're giving them the uh, the way that I explained to my mother. There's like three uh, s- systems within our loan origination system. First and foremost is like an app store, right? Like think about it as an app store. There's a lot of new technology out there. You should be able to not have to essentially build all those tools, but leverage the fact that there's, there's connectivity to all the best point solutions or best uh, bundles of things that like that, than what you're offered today. Second is um, recognizing the inherent uh, tension that exists between technical teams and non-technical teams and empower them both to really collaborate. And how do you do that? First and foremost, you f- need to free up the engineer's time from doing like uh, day-to-day tasks to get that like the business teams ask, ask them to do by virtue of empowering the business teams to do that, those type of uh, changes with local, no local. Let's say you want to change um, uh, the, the, the interest rates that you charge folks, right? Instead of asking the engineers to, to do that, the business team understands what the rationale for doing so is. The only thing is they need it, they, they had to do it in zeros and ones, and, and now they can actually do it in something that resembles more of an Excel or, or a table. A user and, interface, a friendly user a, interface. Exactly, exactly, right? So the engineers can go back to do much more strategic stuff versus tactical stuff. And the business teams can actually finally like not have to fully explain everything to the engineers, right? Because the engineers don't necessarily always know why the business team is doing things. So why not just uh, give them the tools so that they can actually collaborate in a better way and not get in the way of uh, the, the more strategic stuff that both parties need to do. And the last but not least is... Uh, Obviously, automation is amazing, but most financial institutions like keeping a human in the loop or, and, and have dashboards and like that it's they're inherent to their roles. So what we give them is the uh, dashboards that reflect the, the true the nature of the job, right? If you're a loan officer that works at a branch, you're going to have a distinct view of someone that has a, uh, that works at a call center because the interaction with the customer is different. The calls to action should be different. And in, 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 in essence, like your training should be different too. Instead of having a kitchen sink type of screen that has everything, but it's messy, you have a screen that really reflects uh, the unique nature of your role. So that minimizes training and allows folks to ramp up much faster. So then again, App Store, uh, dashboards, and like uh, local, no code that like enables uh, technical teams and non-technical teams to co- collaborate better. Yeah, Andres, so you have created this technology that you sell to uh, financial institutions to uh, help them decide this uh, loan process and, in fact, make it faster. So once you are, you know, like done sell- selling your technology, is there any role a- afterwards for your company or is it like only the financial institutions who have to take care of everything? Yeah, no, I mean, it's an it's enterprise, right? So there's a li- there's always like an implementation phase. 
But I would say one of the things that like are, we're very proud of is like the software tools that we created, right? I think that w- when we think about uh, the space as a whole, up until this point, like in the last 20 years ago, like there, it, this is a, it, it was a combination of consulting and tech work. Um, the the type of the technology was not really there to be able to enable folks to like, especially the, the business teams to get into like changing what, what the nature of the product was, right? So with self serve tools that we've that you see and emerge across other spectrums of technology, we we allow folks to like really shorten that implementation time. So the barrier to entry it's reduced significantly by virtue of actually giving them that capacity to like own their own destiny, right? Like open API philosophies. Uh, and, and integrations that are already pre-built. In, in essence, you're you're doing away with like having to tell people to be get in line for an implementation or adding this new technology because you're actually having uh, it, like an open architecture that gives them that 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 ability to do it on their own. Or if it's not, or or in most instances that were already that would already be pre-integrated in, in, in what the solution that we're giving them. Okay, so how much this impl- imp- implementation phase takes? You know, like time. How much time yeah. it takes? Yeah, the shortest one we ever done it was like a, uh, three weeks, right? Okay, and and, 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 and that just just to put an example in general, what we've seen it, historically in the industry, it's months and not years. So it, it's uh, it's very that that's a, a huge kind of selling point for, for us, right? Like a much faster implementation time, the adaptability of the process and technology. And the, and the fact that like how much faster they can move afterwards. Okay, so you know like uh, these financial institutions, they have been doing these for you know these things, you know like giving out loans and everything for ages now. Yeah. How difficult was it to convince them that you know like this technology that we have built, it's going to save you time, you know, it's going to in, uh, help you, you know, meet your targets faster. Sounded um, like they were coming to him once they saw that the technology was there. Mm-hmm. Were they chasing you down? Yeah, I mean, there's fifteen thousand FIs just in the U.S., right? So mm-hmm. you're going to face a, a mix of, of folks that feel differently about. Uh, but what 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 we know is like it's a rip and replace industry, right? Like a mm-hmm. move what we're doing. Like we're not coming here with a the novel type of thing that like people have never heard about. So it's very easy for us once we actually get their attention. To really demo against uh, what they have because we know kind of what either if they have a homegrown or they have like using some of the incumbent systems uh, based on kind of conducting properly discovery calls and understanding what the the, the specific pain points are um, you can just show them and, and see how this compares and make the both the business case and the technological case for, for the platform so um, I think if if we had if had we built something that would like they had never used, meaning like a completely greenfield opportunity, uh, I think that, that that will be much harder. Uh, but uh, the way that we kind of position it enables us to like really like from day one uh, show the 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 us against them that that uh, situation. Cool. All right, so now it's time to get into some some cool stuff. This is what I really love, Andres. So. You're doing all right now. You've got a very cool company that you've just shared with us. I think it's fascinating because uh, like the last couple of days when we knew we were going to be meeting with you, we were like, we got to figure this thing out. What What is going on? <laughs> yeah. And you very eloquently just kind of brought us up to a little bit of speed where we're not total total dummies anymore. But <laughs> it hasn't always, life hasn't always been where it is now, right? You've, you, you sp- you've spent time on Wall Street working with some pretty big names. Tell us about life early on. Um we all got stories that we we tridged through, uh, but I want to know about yours. So, uh, you immigrated to the states from Bolivia, is that right? That's correct. How, how young were you when you moved? I was eighteen when I moved uh, right out of high school. Okay, so you grew up in Bolivia. I mean, yeah. your all your formative years, a lot of things happened in eighteen years for a person. So, tell us about life growing up. Well, growing up in Bolivia was. I I always remember it as like it's a idyllic time, right? Like uh, obviously, like there's uh, there are a lot of shortcomings uh, as, as a society there. Like, and I mean, the fact that I live here today kind of tells a story that like perhaps there were not opportunities there to like really pursue all the things that I that I've been able to pursue here and the the set of doors that open here 
uh, were not even doors that existed uh, South America. I, I had the fortune that my parents had me in the U.S. Like I was born in the U.S., but I was raised in Bolivia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think from a very early age, I knew that the opportunity to come to the U.S. was going to materialize at some point in, for college uh, or afterwards, right? right. But growing up in Bolivia, kind of key things that I remember, right? Of course, um, family ties, right? Everyone kind of lives in the same city. So uh, this whole notion of uh, seeing each other a few times a year, which is non-existent you just see everyone every weekend right like there's yeah. like a ca- there's a cadence <laughs> that's kind of like how you grew up right yeah, Danny? that's yeah. how yeah yeah we, we grew up yeah yeah so it's like there's a cadence of like i'm going to see grandma uh my maternal side this day paternal side and like y- your cousins will know each other and there's not this massive gap on like your side your your cousins from your mom's side or that side they kind of all know each other right <laughs> so uh that that navig it also probably creates more tension over because they, everyone needs to share their time all the time. So, mm. but I, that was one second. There was no diversity in Bolivia, right? Like, uh, mm. although in Bolivia, the, the, it, people think that they look a little bit different. Someone's, someone is uh, of more European or non, non European heritage. Like it's Bolivia is like the most uh, native uh, American kind of uh, country in, in Latin America or one of the highest mixes. Right. So everyone kind of looks at, uh, Right. Everyone looks kind of the same, right? Kind of the same. So there's no real uh, diversity. So you come to America and all of a sudden, like, it's different, right? Like, in the, <laughs> it, and you never thought about certain things that uh, before coming here. Um, and I, I think in the flip side of that, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's important to point out, I think a lot of the times here, we, we what we don't realize, because similar with you, right, Manny? Because a lot of the folks, in, in, not everybody looks the same, obviously, but right, a little more homogeneous homogenous is that how you say it homogenous this is yeah. dummy um a little more homogenous but here like one of the things that we take for granted is that we can almost anywhere now there's parts of the country where a lot of the folks look the same and in different kind of subsets but you go into the cities and everybody is a little bit different your neighbor yeah. is a high chance ain't gonna look like you yeah so yeah cool. and i live in new york city right so like just oh yeah just think about think about just food choices so all of those things like growing up and, and also you see what you definitely Bolivia, like things that I don't miss is the stark uh, societal differences, right? Like uh, the level of poverty that you witness is mm. uh, it's something that you don't have here, right? Of course you have homelessness and all of that that has grown dramatically in the last couple of years in the U S but I think that what drives that is very different than what drives homelessness in Bolivia. It's not, it's not like the sheer, just, just it's lack tr- of a lot research. of the time it's choice and, Poor choices. Yeah. yeah, whereas in Bolivia, right. just, just just real poverty. What you got? Right. Yeah. You yeah. see kids. You yeah, you see children and 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 things that and 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 elements of poverty you don't see elsewhere. So that in itself was uh, it, it leaves a mark on you, right? Like because you you experience it since you're a little kid, right? So you it, it, as you, you know leave, the bottom, you right? know the you know. bottom. And, and yeah. when you leave, and when you leave, you notice the differences. When you come back, it's even harder because it you realize some of the stuff also became invisible over time where, when you were there because you get used to it too. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, we, that's another thing we, we take for granted is we, I don't know that we can say it and you can see videos and you can see movies and things like that to try to portray it. But we don't understand like the bottom 1% oh, the way, to yeah. some degree in this country live like Kings and Queens compared to some other parts of the world. Yeah, I don't think oh yeah, we, like food is uh, super cheap here on a relative basis, right? Like uh, it's uh, just it can be found. It's in abundance. Yeah, yeah. you know. Hmm. Yeah, people would waste lots of food here. Yeah. So tell me about this. So obviously there was there's probably some struggles and some things that you saw in Bolivia and, and experience. What do you, what do you think the your the biggest blessings for you were growing up the way you did? Um. Obviously, look, my parents got a lot of help, right? So I, I think I had the, the blessing of having my lot tons of time, particularly with my mother, right? Early on in my career, uh, not in my career, in my childhood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in career, my career, you know? in my in my career, it's, it's a all baby. set up. <laughs> <laughs> the, that 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 time uh, was was awesome, right? Like just that idyllic time. Uh, I, I guess I went to very good schools in, in the context of Bolivia, and mm. that that really opened a, a lot of opportunities uh, uh, down the line. Um, that that I'm very grateful in being close to my family now. Now, uh, now, 
now I had my first child a couple weeks ago. Oh, congratulations! And, don't just you. don't just <laughs> run past that boy or girl. <laughs> boy, boy, boy. What's his name? Yeah. Uh, Maxwell. Maxwell. Well, congratulations, yeah. pops. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Heart. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, We're and dads we, too, so. Yeah, I mean, it's transformative, right? But like, I know. For example, my family lives splinter. Our families live splinter all over the world, right? Like my wife mm. is Norwegian, my sister lives in Switzerland, my parents live in DC. Like her family lives all through Scandinavia, and like it, it's it, it. We live here in New York, right? So I now that I see the little baby, I realize, wow, I grew up surrounded by cousins, and then <laughs> and, and since you're asking me how was Bolivia, it, what I think about it is just I was surrounded by friends and family. Yeah. Uh, I definitely have friends here. But family is it, it's same. not as much it's different. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, I, I my family's all over the place. I I get to see my mom maybe twice a year. You know, I haven't seen my sister like in person probably in six or seven years. But when wow. we get around each other, it's like a week, two weeks haven't gone by. It's it's kind of that connection. We went through like foster care and stuff like that when we were young, so we were moved around a lot and stuff. So. Even when, when we're, you know, she lives in Texas. It's There's a thing about family um, when you go through things and you're kind of kind of taken away from each other and stuff like that in ways that you don't really don't have a control, control over as a young age. You, 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 I think you form a bond even that goes pretty far. So when my brother who lives in Michigan and my sister's in, I've got a sister in Washington and a brother in Idaho and a, wow, my sister family. in Texas. We're all over the place. We rarely yeah. see each other. And except on Facebook or something, but when we get together, it's almost like, oh, has it really been that long? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, they, the the fam- those family bonds never break, but uh, of course, it, you need to nurture them, stay in touch, even if you don't see each other. So, so grow- growing up in Bolivia, you know, going through high, what was high school and stuff like? Uh, definitely not like in the U.S. Is I, I was in a class of seventy kids. The- yeah. <laughs> like in the whole like grade. Yeah, the whole grade, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I went to a small school, so that's how it was. Like, I graduated yeah. with seventy-eight people, I think. So yeah, so I knew everyone. Of course, like there's groups and everything, but nothing yeah. like you watch movies of uh, you. I don't know, you watch Super Bad or things like that. that you're not nothing. You're shenanigans. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like, like that. that. You yeah. you didn't have like the troublemakers that were that were being well. Kids are kids, but I guess what? Yeah, not to the extent. It, it, yeah, I, I don't think. Uh, was it I mean, stricter? Maybe, was there more rules? Were like we had uniforms, we had okay. uniforms and that yeah. kind of stuff. So never, never really. You could. I mean, I was a nerdy kid, so it's not that I was trying to really <laughs> express myself through my clothes that much. But right. uh, I, I would say that there's little room for. Uh, but I think people found ways uh, just wearing like. Some, uh, the way that you kind of button up your shirt, your, shirt, your, your pants, shoes. <laughs> shoes. There, there's always like some angle for you to express some level of indiv- individuality. Um, but I, high school, I would say I went to school. To, it was a private school, right? So the spectrum yeah. of kids, which uh, in terms of like level of nerdiness and nerdiness was it, it was pretty free, free form. So I was grateful. I, I know some friends that go, for example, to magnet schools that are just everyone's a nerdy kid. Uh, oh, okay. And and uh, and my 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 school was not like that, right? So uh, if I think it prepared me in a better way to what well, real life you're going to have a whole spectrum of people, right? And that 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 I enjoyed. Then of course coming to school in the U.S., then I actually went with nerdier kids, right? But <laughs> yeah, I would say yeah. high school high school in a way was just that 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 pure representation of what kids are like, right? So. Uh, maybe sometimes you would be annoyed, but uh, in general, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I not, I, I'm not the type of person that has like much of nostalgia. I always think that what the present moment is the best. Yeah. Uh, I'm very grateful of those times, but I never look back and I'm, I want to go back. I, I don't right, want right. to go back to college. I don't want to <laughs> yeah, go back yeah. to my investment <laughs> banking days. <laughs> like, right, I don't we're going to go, we're gonna take you through a journey today. We want to yeah, hear all about yeah. it. All right, I don't so you been the first day of, that I started the business. I I think of it with gratitude. <laughs> Just, oh yeah, right. Yeah. Like I don't have to do that again. It's like, it's I don't know if I should do this because anytime I bring up my wife or kids or my Jen's always like, you know, don't don't no no no. But I got to It's very similar. Like when you're in, how long have you been married, Andres? Uh, 
like the last year. <laughs> About a year. Okay. Yeah. So there's going to come a point in time. This is Brian's wisdom moment here. I've got gray <laughs> in my beard. I can do this. All right. There's going to come a point in time where your wife will be like, you're going to leave me someday. Don't blah, blah, blah. Right. There's going to, there's going to be an argument. There's going to be something silly and it's going to pass. Right. But like I always say to my wife, we've been married going on 20 years. And I say, I say, honey, I don't want to have to go through that stuff again. I don't want to do dating. I don't want to have to like act formal and, and impress. And I mean, yes, I should be doing some of that stuff now. I try vaguely try, but like, we don't want to have to go back and relive those things that, you know what I mean? We did those so we could get to where we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're grateful that like the sum of efforts that happen. Oh, yeah. You don't necessarily want to recreate the effort. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I do a poor job of showing that I'm grateful, which is probably the case, but, and that could be true in our businesses too. Cause sometimes it's like, that's the day to day and the grind and stuff like that. But super, a lot of gratefulness. So, okay. you know, like, Andres, the more you talk about, you know, like, Bolivia, it feels like, you know, like, you're talking about India, you know, your culture and my culture, like, it's almost the same. Well, very yeah. family oriented. Yeah, yeah, family oriented, you know, like, okay, schools, we have uniforms, you know, like, in one grade or one class, you have 60, 70 kids, you know, sitting uh, around. I mean, here, I mean, I see, yeah, it's totally different. It's a, another world, different world. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you compare it, you know, like, yeah. I remember being in school, talking about being in school years and years ago, and you're learning about other, other cultures and like social studies and stuff. And you're learning about, you know, you hit South America, you hit Central America, you hit Europe, you hit India, you hit Asia. And one of the common things for a lot of countries was the how it used to be here too, was that core nuclear family and everybody take care of each other and stay close. Yeah. But something happened with economies and income and working and it it broke down the the ne the necessity to stick close and take care of each other and everybody just kind of started handing off duties to other people they could pay to do things or you know <laughs> no no so. it, 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 there's a trade off that we made as societies right it, yeah. and 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 it's manifesting itself in in good and bad ways right yeah absolutely <laughs> so there there's yeah. those tra those trade offs have cost and and, and 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 as long as we're eyes wide open to it uh, I think we, we we will navigate it, but there's there's definitely collateral damage of all of that. Yeah, if we treat it like a pendulum that goes back and forth, I think we're starting to see some swing back to like, man, my family's important. I don't want them. I don't want to just, you know, have yeah. them go away and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. so you went to UPenn to go. You came to came to the states after high school, and is that where you started? Went to undergrad is at University yeah, of Pennsylvania. I went there for my undergrad. I actually started in Notre Dame, but I transferred. Oh, that, Notre Dame. So. So, okay, I, so you I, were Midwest I, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I lived in the Midwest combined of four years because I, I spent two years in Notre Dame before I transferred to Penn. I transferred to Penn in, in the midst of the financial crisis, right? So that oh, was oh, that was the whole – yeah, that was that was an entire uh, decision on itself. And then I lived in Minnesota uh, uh, for two years too. So we're I, at Minnesota, uh, like in the cities, in the Twin Yeah, cities? Minneapolis. I, I, was, I was in Minneapolis, so I I got my exposure to the Midwest accent and the, the culture and all of that. Uh, uh, but yeah. Minneapolis, I would say like Minnesota and Indiana are very different states, though. Uh, it, it, uh, they, yeah, diametrically yeah. different. Like yeah, way different. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's some sometimes people lump uh, the Midwest into one thing, and it, it's it's a mistake because. Just, uh, I, I think min Minneapolis, it's a so very different culture. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, my my mom and uh, stepfather, they have a place just south of, south of the cities that when they're not in Arizona, they're there in the in the nice months. And it's totally different. And I've been, you know, when you're when you're Notre Dame, just, you know, you're not that far from Chicago. So some of that bleeds out that yeah. way. Chicago is very different than Minneapolis. And yeah. in Indiana in general, if you especially if you get away from from more of the, the the urban areas is a lot different yeah correct it's just uh yeah i, I haven't ne i never went to indy though if you think <laughs> like I, you never I made a trip down to indianapolis no never never i've never stopped there i've only driven through it's a neat looking city yeah. so i don't know yeah. much about the culture there yeah. okay so what was it like okay so notre dame pennsylvania so you're doing your undergrad you know what was what was college life like for you was it head in the I books just it. get through this Good grades it, or yeah, just grew around. Uh, no, 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 I, <laughs> I, I loved college. College in the yeah. U.S. was just, just my uh, getting your feet wet in American culture. Also, Penn and Notre Dame are, are super different schools, right? So 
one is one is very Catholic. The, the other one is like typical East Coast uh, Ivy League. Uh, so even like from a political standpoint, they're very different schools. Like yeah. I, I, I do remember the the Obama election, and and uh, Notre Dame was like the saddest day of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I remember my friends that were in colleges, you know, the schools they were like the happiest days of their lives. So I'm I'm very happy that I got to have that exposure to both sides of America, right? Like, yeah. and and that gives you a balance, I think, over time. And perspective. Because, and perspective. So transferring to Penn, very different school. Uh, I would say, uh, definitely like the 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 bar was much higher, right? Really? Uh, yeah. I I would say. The smartest kids I ever met, even yeah, and I and I went to my I also went to an MBA at a good school afterwards. I would say the undergrads at Penn. I I've met two or three kids there. I I don't think I've run into such a smart person in my life, at least in terms of raw smartness. Uh, yeah. I, I, sometimes I I always go on LinkedIn and see how what they're doing, but yeah. if they live to their entire potential, because gosh, you you meet some kids that are just machines, uh, and that was kind of like. The, the, the first thing that I noticed in terms of like the the the, the student body, but I think on, on on the average person was just just as good and ambitious in both schools. Um, uh, yeah, help they, us they, help us with a little perspective on that because you've got some perspective that a lot of us don't. Being around and a part of that that Ivy League school from a standpoint of intelligence, like. I struggle with understanding because I mean, I mean I spend a lot of time with Manny, so we we he lifts me up a little bit, but you know you know like from a space like I, I was an athlete growing up and I always thought I was a good athlete, but when you get around elite athletes, you realize that there's whether it's DNA or the work that they put in just got them to such a level to where now it's too late to ever get there. Like put yeah. that into perspective when you're talking about smart kids. I mean we can or folks. We can kind of goof around and nerdy, blah, blah, blah. But like, I've been around smart people, but I think you're talking about a different level of smart people. Yeah. And it's the type of, I mean, and this doesn't mean that they're good people either. They're just, sure. I mean, they smart. have an ability to process and learn stuff at a, at a pace that I, I, I really couldn't. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, it, it, it's just like natural for them. Right. Like the, even the, the and, and, and I would say like some of them cannot really explain to you, like, uh, my favorite ones were the ones that could actually explain to you, but some of them, like their brain was just operating a higher order of things. Just like, skipping way they, ahead. Yeah, <laughs> they couldn't really explain to you <laughs> parts of the, it. It was kind of, kind of they spoke a different language, uh, and they, you knew that they were actually coming to the really resolving the things. Whereas, for example, I would took a, take a couple of like a math classes or like game theory classes with them, and like some of the logic of that, it, it, I could like get like 90 percent of the way there, but it would take me a while, but that finishing touch of, of logic, uh, it, it was just really impressive. Um, mm -hmm. And it just w w the, the sheer amount of I, I remember some kids were taking eight, nine classes per semester, and, and they were still getting A's and all of that, right? Wow. It, that that really shows you. It was not a com it was also ambition uh, combined with like just uh, horsepower, yeah. and that 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 it was just. I didn't know how. I mean, I tried to take more than five, six class per semester, but I just couldn't really do it at that at at, uh, at that same level. So you you develop a sense of uh, humility. I probably did not have that level. The, the, uh, uh, my my humility levels were probably on the low end before I met these people, and and then like you actually you get slapped in the face by just <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it just shows you that you just need to work harder, right? Like yeah, that yeah. in. I think like sweat really beats most of most of the time. Uh, like you just constant. You need to show up, right? So that that is also very important. Like if anything, what like yeah, my my Ivy League experience show, show, taught me. It's like you can you, you can outwork most of the, the the smartest people out there. So just be outworking. Just that's your superpower, right? Maybe you have more stamina. <laughs> yeah. So or drive. Yeah, but if you have if you have both. You, you're a machine, right? Like you have like the Elon Musk oh. of the world, people that actually have both things or want to put in the have, time. They have, they have both. And yeah, you, 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 you just, you have no shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to teach my son that concept right now. It's like, he's, he sees his sister really good at a lot of things like artsy kind of stuff. And she's really talented and it's relatively natural. 
it's in that's in our blood for sure. But with him, he's super smart. He's read more books than I have to this date and he's 12, but he wants to do something productive. He's like, dad, I'm not good at anything. I'm like, son, in my wise voice, <laughs> which immediately turns his ears off. He's like, I'm like, you have to be willing to put the time in to get good. I'm like, what are the things you're good at? And he's like, video games. I like, <sighs> I'm like, were you good at any of those games when you first turned them on? He's like, no, I died a lot. I lost a lot. I'm like, how did you get good? I kept playing. Yeah, I can look on my app and see how many hours you play a week, like 24 to 30 hours a week on some games. And I'm like, if you put that into something you enjoy doing that is productive, like you'll destroy everybody, bud. And it, it hasn't switched because there's labor involved. There's toil. There's, <laughs> right, yeah. there's boredom, you know, and <laughs> like he wants to know how to make a video game. So I give him access to tools to do that. He starts it and he gets like a couple hours into it. He's like, I'm, I'm bored, dad. I'm like, well, then you really don't want the outcome. <laughs> yeah. I always like that analogy of the hedgehog and the fox, right? Like, it, 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 it's you want to be like super deep about one thing, or you want to know a lot, very little bit of, about a lot of things. Um, oh, yeah. The Renaissance. Yeah. yeah. So, which one you want to be, right? And make a conscious choice of how you want to approach learning, lifelong learning. And you just, uh, I think like before starting a business, I tend to tend my my tendency was to identify more like a fox. I wanted to just learn a ton, but like really not very deep. Uh, and now when you start a business, you kind of were forced to be a hedgehog because mm -hmm. you need to be like the subject matter expert about this little thing, and so that you can come to the shows, <laughs> explain, explain, explain in layman terms. Right? Yeah. Like as you're. That's 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 perfect. It's that it's that whole good at everything but great at nothing kind of thing. Or yeah. they talk about, and I'm not any good at this, but they talk about like when you're building something, you, the golden egg. You know, you protect that goose and that golden egg. You don't diversify. You just you focus in on it, and then when it's when it's fully incubated, then you kind of diversify with things. But you've yeah. got a laser focus in on what you want to master. Yeah. No. 100. percent I mean. In general, uh, diversification. Most of the people that have really hit it out, hit home runs. They were not really diversified, right? Uh, if you, yep. it's one maybe thing. they may, yeah, just one thing. Yeah, better than anybody. Yeah. Okay, so getting back on you know like uh, about your you know like MBA. So after your MBA, I mean. You started this business in. Uh, well, I want to hear about his work on Wall Street and all those yeah, different I mean, crazy that's what places. I'm, you know, trying to yeah, you know, yeah. get into. You know, like okay, was that like after doing your MBA? Was, was it after it, undergrad and then no, you did some work? No, it was after undergrad. After undergrad, like my, I got my first job, like thirteen, fourteen years ago, uh, in Wall Street, like at a bank. Um, I would say the day I got my first job at, in Wall Street, I knew that. I had this very strong feeling that my life had changed in a, in a positive way. I knew that it was going to be hard and everything, but it did, that it opened doors that, and I do, I, my interview was in the, in downtown Manhattan. So I was mm -hmm. pretty close to the stock exchange. I got out of the subway. I was visiting my sister uptown. She, she used to go to school in, 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 at Columbia. And I got out of the subway and I see I have, I had a voicemail. I pick up, the, I see the voicemail and it's from the bank I had just interviewed. And I called them, and it, it was just to tell the to tell me I got the offer. And it's gonna sound super corny, but I, my voice broke, right? Like, yeah, I, I, correct. I, I, oh my god! Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> son of immigrants, right? Like, just yeah. uh, it just you knew you knew that the, I knew that that I uh, that things were not going to be the same again, and yeah. but in the most positive of ways. So of course, there's gonna be a lot of hard work and all of that. But I had I was a hundred percent grateful at that point. Um, and then like you start working, it's like, you're, you're very young, right? So, but it's tough, but the hours are grueling, but of course it's the best job. So it's not that you're like, uh, out in the fields and, and it's cold, but it, you're working a hundred hour weeks, uh, mm -hmm. for months. And, uh, at, at that point, uh, school doesn't really prepare you for that, right? Like it, it, you're, you're a little bit of a diva, uh, despite the fact that I had, I, I had worked as a car salesman and things like that during the summers. Okay. I did it just didn't know like just that level of mental stamina that you needed to keep it. It's just very different than like being 
uh, a very uh, focused student. It's just a different level of focus. There was no and, punching in and punching out, right? Yeah, and it's and it's in school you can be wrong, you can be get an A minus, and, and and at work like especially Wall Street, you kind of need to be always uh, right. There cannot be mistakes on pages, double spaces, things that like at first on the surface seem ridiculous become kind of like the the way that people perceive you and like they perceive you as not being incompetent um it's pretty tough i mean i, I saw yeah. uh, i saw colleagues just just being and once they perceive that they're incompetent they, they start treating you differently and it's it's a tough environment if you just don't the and and but, but if you're doing well people don't second guess even if you're making mistakes that's why like the, the very beginning it's fundamental to leave a very good impression on your yep. teammates uh at Wall Street was good. I mean, I, if anyone wants to like develop a uh, work ethic, uh, I I cannot think of a better testing ground than that. Like, I to this day, I I I, I work very hard now, but Wall Street it, like <laughs> takes you to take you to very hard, like limits of your <laughs> the mental health and physical health. I think so. Yeah, but you're young. You can just, take it. But you learned where your limits were. You yeah. learned how far you can push beyond them. I think that's great. I think like getting to a point where, especially at a young age, uh, you can get to your limits, go beyond them and not quit. Man, that's that's what people need to to really test metal and develop yeah. kind of an inner steel to, yeah. right? To and, like, I, and I don't want also like to do any self pity right like frankly speaking no. you get paid you get paid quite well to also yeah. like, there's you have all the incentives they're like no the, i don't i don't pity yeah. you i i'm jealous <laughs> like i worked as a kid in high school i worked at a fish factory you know early mornings and after school and I'm, in the summer and i was do i was working when people were playing and i still didn't have anything to show for it but like after college it was it was you know i worked for the college and i got a job and it was fine i worked hard but my metal wasn't tested. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of those situations. I mean, I, again, I don't want things to be so hard that life sucks, but I love a good challenge. You know what I mean? So I, I'm jealous that from a standpoint of right out of college, you got maybe not right out of college, you were doing some other things, but you got to, it, you got to, I mean, that's a talk about a shark tank. You're in with the sharks there, right? Oh yeah. No, it's, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. It's, it's, you don't hear about that. You know, you hear about that. I mean, maybe you do a little bit, but you hear maybe about the upper levels of Wall Street that's glorified in the movies and maybe a little bit when people, you know, the the underdog story guy gets a job, works his way up. I think it's really, I think it's cool. I oh, know yeah, the, 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 the under the, the starting level is not very glamorous. <laughs> it's, it's like, you're, pretty, you're not in the mail room, right? You're, you're <laughs> using your tools that you learned. <laughs> no, I was doing like valuations and all of that. Right. But in essence, okay. it's your bosses are doing the, 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 what you see in the movies is what your bosses do, bosses right? Like doing, opening yeah. their book and talk about the investment opportunity and like <laughs> that analysis and talk with the CEO. Like yeah. you, you see the CEOs uh, every like blue moon, but it, maybe you're on their calls and all of that. But like, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's it's not you're not having power lunches. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you, you will take a couple of flights with them carrying yeah. books <laughs> or iPads. So now, did you live in the city before you took the job, or did you get the job and then move? No, I I, I used to live in Philly, right, for undergrad. Right, and right. I moved, I moved I moved to New York right after undergrad. So yeah, right I've been, so you were in I, New York already. Yeah, I was in New York. So I've been on and off New York for the last 12, 13 years. Okay. So I noticed that your company is in the UK. Tell us about tell us about that. Hey, or before I, you know, we, we get into that, I okay. just want, I have this question you know, like for you. So after doing your, your uh, Harvard, you started working, you know, like for different, different companies. Becoming a entrepreneur, was that always the plan or it just happened? There was always that, that itching desire, right? Like going back to the, the diversification play. Um, mm -hmm. go in, I think going back to like, as an immigrant, you're kind of like scared of uh, not building enough of a nest egg. So uh, I, I, I had this kind of, I wanted to de-risk entrepreneurship, which is kind of an oxymoron. I don't even know if that makes sense. But at least mentally, uh, I knew that I wanted to just build a kind of, uh, a mosaic of experiences and enough of a cushion underneath those experiences experiences for me to kind of like take that leap of faith right mm -hmm. and bet mm -hmm. on myself so 
I, uh, I always dreamt of like owning or building something. And uh, when the opportunity came and the set of ideas started kind of like appear in the canvas of my head or just the opportunity to like start this with Mark, my co-founder and all of that, I, I realized, say hey, like, this is, this is the moment to do it. Um, I did not idealize entrepreneurship either. I, I, I thought it was the hardest thing to do because mm. you make very little money. Like the outcomes, there's 10% chance that, that you will make it if not lower. So like most startups fail. Yeah. Um, and that is the idea. Uh, yeah. So really just taking that plunge is a real plunge right and yeah and yeah and, and not everyone can do it i mean there are like two types of personalities in the world you know like one people who want okay if they are having a good job you know they're satisfied with that but whosoever becomes entrepreneur it's not just i believe it's not just you know by chance i mean there is always an you know something inside that you want to build and yeah. of course you know when when you do that uh, you some somewhere in the back of the mind you always know that you know like whenever i do that i'll have to start from scratch and that's a big risk that's like you know you are living a comfortable life now and then you are starting from scratch so i mean i believe every entrepreneur always have that itch inside them mm -hmm. yeah. so and you also had that you also seen it in your i mean at least i i saw it in my parents right like they overcame a lot of their own difficulties and solved like did that prior generation the the way that I see it is, you pass on bigger dreams into your children because your your parents kind of overcame things, and you realize if they could do it, then I can do it, and like you find that extra energy to do even more. So you just give, you pass on that ability to dream and dream bigger than the prior generation, and knowing that uh, there's like this Argentine com uh, comic uh, writer. It, he talks about like in order to make uh, good bread, you need to turn a lot of people into flour. So like mm -hmm. my parents were that flour, right? Like in order for us to be the bread that we are today, they turn themselves to flour, and like now I'm turning myself into flour to to to, to make my my children and and future generations get a, a, a better piece of bread. So just that that can do that vision and like really realizing that you're building on top of others other other efforts it's kind of what, what made me think yeah i can do it like uh i mean and if it doesn't work like i tried and i tried and i'm yeah. gonna be very proud of it and it's not the end of the world it's not that i'm like going to mars <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to build a loan origination system for banks. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started this, you know, like business, I mean, you uh, st you talked to your co-founder, you ran that idea through him. I mean, so was he the he, tech side of things, or how did yeah, you guys get to the technology? No, he's a, he's heavy tech, right? Like he understands okay. the product. He's a I I I don't. I mean, going back to like the 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 the, 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 the kids I met at Penn, he probably is like the other person i know that aside from the kids at Penn that have that sheer mental capacity that's unique like the level of organization is just off the charts right to, in, in order to build a great great technology you need that right particularly when it's enterprise great technology like you're selling to banks great units you know, finance companies that need super secure very organized stuff no um, room for it's been yeah yeah, no, yeah there's yeah okay so you ran this idea through your you know co-founder and he liked your idea and that's how you started your business right that's how you do yeah, your business started. yeah we knew each other i mean mm -hmm. uh, we knew each other from business school uh mm -hmm. so we started like kind of, um getting uh, chatting about the idea and like then we perfected it together and uh we started like that direct to consumer brand and then like we switched to uh, uh business to business enterprise software and that's how we raised all, all the capital we raised but uh, yeah, that that entire ideation phase, he was uh, we, we were we were both together at that point already. So you know, like I have this question. So you had this idea, and then you ran it through him. So if this guy was not on board, would you still have done this? Uh, yeah, I think I was. Uh, I mean, the idea would change, uh, got refined, but, but uh, yeah, I would have done. I, I already, I was already kind of doing this on my yeah, own. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I had already like uh, created the C corp and. Uh, I had no job at that point other than building this business. And like you said, when we started, you had made, you had, the original idea was a direct to consumer product and service, right? It wasn't yeah, yeah. necessarily what it is now. Yeah. And I, I was like three, four months in into the idea when I actually, 
but it's nothing, right? It's in 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 the in, in startups are multi multi years, if not decades, the type of processes, right? So yep. three four months is kind of when people think about the humanity in the context of the age of the universe. <laughs> so <laughs> so right. I had spent my opportunity cost plus I don't know a couple of five. 10k maximum in terms of actual dollars that, that, that they have gone out of the door. So I'm a big believer that in the early days you should be as generous. You always need to be generous with equity, but like especially in the early days, just so un, such uncertainty that you need to you need to recruit the best and like incentivize them accordingly. Yeah, it's like what we learned. It's what we, what we learned mm-hmm. uh, in our last episode about sometimes it's. Uh, I'm not calling your original idea a bad idea, but it didn't yeah. turn out to be the good idea, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's that first yeah, it idea evolves. that yeah, that's what, yeah. it evolves. It, mm-hmm. it is you take a step forward with your idea, then you take two steps back when someone says they don't like it, and then yeah. you move forward because something changes or something better gets created out of it. Absolutely. So this happened, you know, like uh, during the COVID era, right? Yes. I mean that that's when you know, like you had developed this idea or you know started working on this. I mean during that time. Bad. You know, yeah. During that time, most of the financial institutions were not, you know, like offering loans. I mean, everything was down. Mm-hmm. You know, at that particular time, you came up with this idea. You came up with this, you know, technology, and you sold it to banks. Uh, I mean, the financial institutions, right? I mean, that's, that's well. Here's the, here's the thing. I think that some people don't maybe think about sometimes is things were down, but the government was pumping money into the economy. Yeah, the government and, was, but not the and, financial institutions, but it, right? And it was pumping money And also money brand to... branches were closed, right? So like yeah, banks that's needed what, to find yeah. a way to like, the few, even so the normal uh, mar- go-to-market motion was through branches, but if you don't have people at branches, you gotta find a new way. You find a new way. And you, that's when they realize that the technology uh, stack that they had was insufficient, right? So and, and and they still are coming coming up with that realization, right? Like when you see like the graphs of the ma- amount of bank branches in the U.S., it's just like just downward spiral. Yeah, they're not mm-hmm. they're not bouncing back. So you need to uh, find your customers where they are, and that usually is in the living rooms. So yeah. make it very easy for them to uh, minimize keystrokes, right? There, there's w- w- nothing more annoying than like refilling an application fifty times, right? Like it, the, all the tools are there with minim, with minimal amount of input from the customer to actually like apply for a loan. So that's kind of what we how we help banks and credit unions finance companies. It just make it seamless uh, and, and and make it seamless to also adopt technology that helps you do that. Those are kind of uh, some of the value props that we have for them. Um, any thoughts on what's been going on with the the whole Silicon Valley bank stuff? Uh, for me, that was not a surprise, right? Uh, the <laughs> my some of some people I know, like I actually warned them. Uh, oh, really? This leading to, I mean, th- there was enough lead time, right? Like even if you looked at the at the company, like three, even three to six months before, as the Fed was uh, raising rates, that that could be a problem. Um, there were a couple of uh, series of changes, I think, in management. I, I don't fully remember all, but like what happened in December of uh, early days with that business, uh, if you, you could see that some- The writing was on the wall. Yeah, and like the last, uh, when they announced the equity infusion and all of that, uh, the, the, the morning, the afternoon before, the day, like 24 hours before, or so the, the, the went, they went to the receivership or whatever the term is, um, I did tell folks, right? Like numbers look pretty bad. I, I mean, it's not that I did tell folks on Twitter. I just people in my my network of co-founders, yeah, yeah. Okay. co-founders, I told them, like, listen, just just get out of your money out because I've seen this playbook play in in emerging economies, and this doesn't look good. Um, and I, I was obviously not the only one thinking about it. So <laughs> it, it was sad to see. Uh, a major player in kind of the startup scene, mm-hmm. but you can also talk about just horrible managerial um, components of what happened there, right? Oh, I some feel of the bad people at, that they were bringing in at the top, it was just yeah. yeah I mean, there was the real issues, right? I, I I think, I mean, I I could be wrong on this, but they didn't have either a risk or a specific role, and it's there's always a combination of luck and things, but 
just the the uh, the mismatching of assets that's mm-hmm. an unforgivable uh, unforgivable sin right so yep obviously like it, the collateral and all the other banks are fresh republic and all that afterwards it, it was crazy but it was scary times it, it felt uh like a very 08 light type of days um it could have been worse it was bad but it could have been worse yeah right? yeah yeah i i'm very grateful that i could ultimately did not the the the, 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 the the systemic risk did not get fully triggered but i don't think we're fully out of the woods right we'll see what the fed does uh yeah. next year like rates are high inflation today had like a relatively uh hopeful signs of uh, cooling but there's there, there are a lot of changes that are coming, and I think election year and all of that, it's, it's just going to get... A lot funky. of factors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you see AI affecting your industry? Uh, there's going to be a lot of applications, right? Uh, um, but it, it, we're in that kind of 1998, 1998, nine time in which the applications will come little by little. There's going to be a lot of... Uh, it was, there's, But I think it's the real deal, right? Uh, for us, yeah. it's, uh, in in the, the software as a service type of vertical as we do is like reading documents, uh, optimizing pro- uh, processes, kind of suggestions in terms of like uh, efficiencies. Um, for us, we keep a close eye look into it, um, but it's it, we also don't rush into like, hey, like this is we're not going to change our names to Fuse AI, right? Right. But we're definitely going to find. A, True applications or sources for it, and we're we're working with our partners in terms of that. Um, I think like then the 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 area where you're going to see immediate effect is in chatbots, agent portals, that type of stuff, right? I I think the what it's going to be devastating or could be devastating is like all all, all the call centers you have overseas, right? That, that the, the whole concept of globalization and bringing and and, and, and that that it. That they, that could have real negative consequences, and we're not going to feel it right away in the U.S. because, of course, those jobs are not here already. But yeah. um, when you think about we, like the yeah. scary side of things, I think that you're going to see that relatively soon. Yeah, like training, like training your AI to do things for you. Which I was doing that yesterday. I was working on my marketing budgets. I was telling, I was telling uh, Manny, I'm working on this stuff. I'm trying to speed up the process so it doesn't take months to do. And, you know, I trained, I trained my, you know, chat GPT prompt engineer to set up my marketing budgets and give me the data I need it and, and extrapolate it over the next 12 months at a 5% growth rate. And it's like, okay, <laughs> a couple of minutes later, it's, there's what I need. I mean, I still got to dig in and plug real numbers into it, but I would have spent way too much time doing that on my own. No, no, it's, 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 it's incredible. What happens when you can tr- you can train a prompt engineer to be a contact center person, yeah, and to answer a phone call with a with a, a a linguistic voice of your choosing that will respond to prompts that it can understand in, from somebody else's voice in the manner that you've told it to. Like, yeah, you're absolutely right, Andreas. That's just to think about. There's there's hundreds of thousands of of real people jobs that could be kind of displaced yeah i I believe ai will bring in you know like its own opportunities every time every time i see a new technology coming you know people evolve people adapt and then you know like okay there are more job opportunities than ever i mean well, I mean, we have solved the problem this. and a new one is created. Yeah. I and mean, we, we have talked, I mean, like, you know, like uh, if, if we talk about, you know, like in the perspective of, you know, like population, you know, in the 1900s and now, I mean, like we are like seven times, the po- world population is like more than seven times. Mm-hmm. Like there are seven billion, eight billion people and there have been technological advances, you know, like, okay, people lost their jobs, but new opportunities were created. Now, like right now, the kids who are, uh, you know, like new newborns, by the time they are like one or two, they know how to operate, you know, like a cell phone, right? The mobile yeah. phone, you know, they can play games in that, you know? Yeah. Right. So people are evolving, you know, my minds are evolving and, you know, like I, I believe, you know, like, okay, AI will help to create more opportunities, you know, people yeah. who can adapt, who can, you know, like evolve, they will grow. Yeah. I think that, I think you're right. There will be opportunities as long as we, as long as there's, I think you've got to put brackets around things. But. Yeah. What do you think, Andres? Yeah, uh, I'm. I mean, I'm excited. I'm, uh, but uh, I'm. Ca- I'm cautiously optimistic. That 
obviously we do not have the benefit of hindsight on this at all. So I, we need to navigate it very carefully um, yeah. because it's it's the magnitude. I'm just seeing the uh, at least. I mean, I, I do not have the benefit of being like my grandfather and having seen other uh, other uh, revolutions. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's well, it, it at least relative to the internet. The internet seems a jo- like a joke. Right? <laughs> Every day, you, where you see an AI, like just the ability and how uh and then like i i see it i use it every day right so mm-hmm. and how it's and it's hard to imagine a time when we didn't use it and think about it like ChatGPT was launched a year ago right so, and that's and it's super clunky still in many ways so <laughs> yeah like it gets it. halfway through a thought and it stops and it's like hey what are yeah. you doing buddy i'm yeah. like already trained to be mad at my my chat GPT AI when it stops, I'm like, hey, you better finish that thought. I don't want to hit regenerate. I like what you did in the beginning. You need to continue. But it's yeah. like, rah, rah, rah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spinning oh, its it, wheels. It's incredible. But you know, it's it, what's interesting is all these changes, even in our lifetimes. You know, Andreas, and you know, you're a little bit older than me, Manny. I'm a little bit older than you, Andreas. But for for the most part, when you there's there's like principles to life that I think haven't necessarily changed. Like I learned years ago the saying. Methods are many, principles are few. Methods change, but principles never do. Like the methods, these methods that are using the AI or the internet in the late '90s and early 2000s, or how you know how how that changed you know the music industry and all these other things and economies of scale change and the way we live change and we have cell phones and we don't use phones that plug into the wall and but we still we still sit down at a table and have dinner for the most part. We we strive for that kind of stuff and we still. We try to get around each other and live in a way that, you know, that's civil. Um, and that's, that's I think, the grounding factor that we can't lose. Yeah, no matter 100%. how many things we stick on top of it to make life more comfortable. Are you a sports guy? Of course, yeah. I love sports. Okay. okay what's your sport of choice? I, I would say, like, uh, uh, American football and football. Uh, you I, like both. I, so yeah. you like... The real like, world football, and you like yeah, American football. Yeah, and I like Formula okay. One. Those three, I would say F1. Formula One. Yeah, those. So you're a racing guy. I love racing too. I don't get to watch much of it anymore. But w- I live really close to uh, a big road track. We both do here. It's about it's about 30 minutes away from us here. It's Road America and Elkhart Lake. Yeah. So it's a four mile road course. I don't know that they do F1 there, but they do GT3 and stuff like that. And yeah, but I love racing. Oh yeah, no, I love. I mean, have you ever got to drive out on a track or anything? Yeah, I've been on a track a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I did I one of it. those experiences too. So you like American football? You like, um, you like actual football? I'm, you know, we call it soccer, obviously. Yeah. Um, Manny's a big cricket guy. Um, India's right. killing everybody in the yeah, in, the, in the, the World Cup. Yeah, World Cup of cricket. Um, so do you follow sports enough to kind of tell us what your you know your favorite team is and stuff like that? Let's say for NFL. I love the Jets, but Jets. I love I like torture. You like torture. I was gonna say you love heartbreak. You love pain and misery. No. Yeah. So and, how hard was that when Rodgers went down for you guys in first uh, first game of the season? It, 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 I mean, it, it was on, on brand though. So yeah, it was, it was on brand. I love it. it was, you guys are like, well, of course. Why wouldn't that happen? So. I mean, I mean, years ago, you guys got Favre, and he played really well for a year, but yeah, yeah that's no. crazy. So, but the Jets don't have a bad team. They have a really strong defense, but you're yeah. right. They're they're heartbreakers for sure. Yeah. They, they, they're they, better than the Giants. Oh, yeah, the Giants are awful this year. <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> New yeah. York has two teams, Manny. And the thing is, like, in general, I, I think New York sports folks and don't really – the, the level of uh, religious fervor that you kind of see in other cities. I, I remember in, in Minnesota, like the Vikings were life, uh, life right? Yeah. People care. Uh, I, I I do remember that I was here when like the Giants won the Super Bowl. Is it against the Patriots? It might be. It, yeah, they always yeah. beat the Patriots. Right? Those are underdogs. Yeah. 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 And uh, I remember thinking, okay, let's go out. I don't really care about the Giants, but I just want to be in a city that celebrates the Super Bowl victory. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there There's so many other things that, to do, right? You're, yeah, you don't hang your life on it. That's yeah. how it is here in Green Plus, Bay. You, know, you like, hang your life on the New Packers. York is just not, you know, like, okay, it's a global city. You know, yeah, like people from all so other ethnicities are there. All other countries are there. And I believe that plays a factor. I mean, that's why, you know, like, okay, it's not that crazy. 
they yeah. are, you know, like for, and people for just game. celebrate New Year's here and victory day during the war. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's in not... general, Penn Penn, Penn Penn basketball is not that strong. I I, <sighs> I think in the last couple of years, Cornell made Princeton made it into like the, the March of Madness, but yeah, in general, yeah. I don't remember. Uh, I, Penn won the Ivy League football tournament, I think back to back years when I was at Penn. Yeah. And no, no one cared either. No so, one cared. <laughs> no one cares. No one cares. I mean, it's if you're not, if you're if you're not first division in college football, I think like the fervor is also pretty. Uh, that's something I loved about my Notre Dame years that I actually got to see college football. Notre Dame like, is but, crazy. Yeah, yeah, that is that is amazing, right? And and then I went to Penn for two years, and I I didn't have tailgate Saturdays, and, and it was just <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a trade off. It was a trade off. <laughs> Is it a real yeah. trade-off? <laughs> so how about we get, we're in holiday season now, full-fledged. Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas right around the corner. Any big plans? Any any big traditions you have with the family? Do you travel back home? Do you stick around? Yeah, we're going home uh, next week to, me, to be with my parents in D.C. Uh, okay. My, my sister's actually going to the F1 Grand Prix in, in Las Vegas, and, she's, uh, <sighs> and then she's going to come tell us all about it uh, that week. And <laughs> uh, in, in uh, December, we're going to Europe. Uh, we have the red. Um, I'm, my sister lives in Switzerland. Uh, we're going to a week in London. Uh, the, the three of us, me and the boy and my wife, the three, we oh, just to have cool. some time there, and then just visiting family through the through the continent, and come back here after Christmas. That sounds amazing. Christmas travel. Well, all right, bud. You gave us more time than you planned. I really appreciate you. Your time is valuable, much more than ours. But this was enjoyable, no. Manny. You yeah. Had a good time. Yeah. I had a- oh, this is great. I think our audience will too. Um, Andreas, it's been an honor and a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks for spending the extra time with us and have a great holiday. Hopefully we'll bring you on again sometime and see how you're doing. Oh, we'd love to update you. I earned that right. And then again, sorry for being late and, and the honor was all mine. So uh, oh, no worries. <laughs> all right, bud. All right. Take care. You're right. See you, man.